it's on these ones. Okay, cool. <laughs> so I am um, not a Japanese artist. Uh, uh, I'm the co-founder of an AI company, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, the last two and a half years of my life where uh, me and a, a team of great people have tried to build this AI company. And I think the dynamics of like building an AI company are different than building a software company. Uh, and and that, the, the, the good thing and the bad thing of that is that there's no kind of rule book. So every day we go to work and we try to like invent the business model uh, and the technology changes and business appetite for AI changes. So I hope there's some like good insights here. So we named the company Deep Learning which we thought was like a clever joke because it's like a Nigerian domain name and really the origin of the company starts with like, it's actually hard to get a Nigerian domain name. You gotta call Nigeria and like you gotta figure out how to send 18 American dollars to Nigeria to pay for the domain name. <laughs> but more importantly, it's like an homage to a technique which I'm sure you all heard of called deep learning which happened to be invented you have maybe a block north of here at a lab at the University of Toronto. Um, so it's really exciting to, to do this uh, back in my hometown and, and, and exciting to try to build this business here. Uh, so starting a business, an AI business in Toronto in 20, uh, 2015 turned out to be like excellent timing and I must admit, totally dumb luck. So in two years, uh, we've gone from four people to, to 40 people. We just opened an office in New York about a month and a half ago. Uh, we have excellent technology partners in NVIDIA and Microsoft and Amazon. Uh, we raised nine and a half million dollars. Uh, and we get to do cool, really cool AI projects with companies from all over. Uh, so it's been, it's been a really exciting journey. And I guess, I guess it started, you know, um, started with Professor Jeff Hinton. So, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this story, but just to recap, uh, the modern AI movement, as I said, could be traced to something that happened in 2012, uh, again, not so far from here. So uh, Professor Hinton and a bunch of his grad students uh, created, uh, entered this contest, and the contest was, uh, you needed, there's a bunch of images, and the goal is to get a computer to recognize the images. And so a bunch of uh, universities from around the world submit algorithms, and the, the algorithm that uh, is able to classify the correct images the most accurately wins. So it's been going on for a few years, and uh, uh, in 2012, uh, Professor Hinton and his, his lab entered, and they kind of creamed the competition. Uh, and they used this technique called deep learning which involved just showing the computer many, many images and telling them what they were. And then the computer would learn, I'm deliberately using air quotes, uh, what, what was a cat, what was a dog, what was a tree, what was a tank. Um, so that event basically set the kind of nerd world afire. And they started to apply what worked for images on sound and on many, many other problems. And it turned to be, it's like head and shoulders above in terms of a technique uh, than what, what would happen, what happened before. Uh, and the pace of research has grown like furiously in the last few years. So um, traditionally university researchers would, would publish their results in like print journals. Um, and now they, they just, when they have an idea, they just put it up online, and there's literally hundreds of papers of people applying deep learning to, to different applications, of people like tweaking different algorithms um, that come out every day. So this, this kind of, all of these things that were going on was kind of the, the inspiration for starting this company. So, yes, so we thought, um, a good place to apply all of the exciting things that were happening in, like, in the research world was in the enterprises, so big companies. And big companies have like two things. Uh, they have lots and lots of data, and they have lots of interesting problems. And we thought we could apply these techniques to their interesting problems, and, and remembering that the data is fuel for these algorithms, it'd be like a perfect place to put it. Uh, and I think 
those two assumptions were fair. So there are definitely way more interesting problems than we thought of, and actually way more data than we thought of at these companies. But one of the things we realized in doing it was that the kind of machine learning problem was like a small fraction of the actual challenges it takes to put AI into an enterprise. So um, this is actually from a paper written by some folks at Google. Um, and I think it's a good kind of like visual representation of all of the kind of things you have to do and their proportional size and importance before you can even start to do AI. So we learned very quickly that we had to do things like uh, clean data, right? That we had to do things like um, provide uh, the, the kind of technical infrastructure. So AI requires these high-powered chips called GPUs, which kind of big, big companies don't have, so we had to figure out a way to get them in there. And all of their data had to remain totally secure at all times. And then when you build an, like an awesome AI system, it has to actually run back in the old legacy system of the enterprise. So these enterprise systems are like, they could be 20 years old. So you have this cool piece of AI, and it's actually got to talk back again to, to the old enterprise system. So this is also compounded by the fact that these organizations are, uh, they tend to be political. And all of those boxes on the previous screen, they're all teams of people. And sometimes they don't necessarily play nice. So there was a huge kind of social engineering uh, effort that needed to go on to make these things a reality. Um, and that kind of, checking the timer. Uh, it, it kind of speaks to like a big theme of the work we do, which is collaboration. So um, in order for us to do this cool AI work, we know that we don't only really have to sort out all of the kind of technical problems, but we actually have to like enforce collaboration among all of these crazy and intricate moving parts. And I think um, if, Large corporations, especially banks, were a few years ago terrified of, of what they called their like Uber moment. So they were worried about like an upstart coming out of nowhere and like destroying the, the, the business they had. And I think that in AI, actually the opposite is happening. So, so the, the, the interesting things about, let's say, banks, but any big company, is they have this kind of huge mountain of data. But what they don't have is the, the kind of tools and techniques to do interesting AI on it. So we're kind of forced to work together. So rather than like disruption in the classical sense, it's more collaboration, um, which I think is an interesting, interesting theme. Okay, I'm specifically going to talk about um, our first engagement ever, which was with Scotiabank, who have been fantastic partners uh, over the last few years. So um, our engagement with Scotiabank started with a really excited conversation with an executive who uh, had heard about all of these cool things in AI and just wanted to do something. So he, he spent like three hours like writing all of these ideas on, uh, on a whiteboard and, it, and it, he, 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 he was crazy and we had to like calm him down. And uh, <laughs> so the, the, where we settled was uh, in building an algorithm that understands their credit card customers better. So they, they had an algorithm already, but this, so this algorithm uh, was made by human beings, um, and it took about six months to build. And they would start with about uh, 1,000 variables per person, per transaction, and then they would kind of manually go through them and pick uh, about 10 and build the kind of algorithm with those 10. And the issue with, with that algorithm is they, it takes them six months to build, and it lasts for, they go stale after a year, and then they need to be rebuilt. So can we build an algorithm that actually learns over time? Um, so the, the, first, the, the, the first way we set it up was that uh, we were given the exact same set of data, the 1,000 variables. Uh, and the exact same conditions as the, as the human modelers. And we were going to build like a deep learning model that was tasked with like beating the score. And one really important thing about, about deep learning models is that when you have 10 variables 
and you have a, a model based on 10 variables, they're kind of easy to understand. So if you know if one thing goes up, then something goes down, or if something goes down, something goes up. Uh, and it kind of builds kind of confidence that you kind of know what's going on. When we're throwing thousands of variables at a problem, um, it's far harder to know why a computer made a decision and why it didn't. So they're like, so the, and, and the bank was aware of this, and, and so they're, they're, they were like, uh, if, you want to, uh, if you want us to like rip up our infrastructure and put in your new model, it has to beat it by a significant margin, because it's really not worth it unless we see significant improvements in backtesting. So they put the model into production in December 2016. Um, we started with a small allocation. So uh, I think like 10% was devoted to ours, and like 90% was devoted to the old model. And as time went on, more was given, given to ours, as long as it did better. And now 100% um, is running in our model, and it's running on millions of Scotiabank credit cards every day, which is which was uh, really an exciting, an exciting win for us. And it did s a few things. So I would say there were kind of two camps at Scotiabank, but I think there are two camps at any big organization. There are the group of people who think AI will save the world and uh, solve all, all the problems. And I think that's maybe a quarter of the people. And then there, there are 75% of the people who maybe have kind of a healthy skepticism about it. Um, so having these results and having the success and measuring them in like um, the ultimate measurement was how much money were they able to collect on credit cards, uh, built kind of enthusiasm and trust in the organization. Um, the other thing it did was that the goal here was that we wanted to build like a pipeline of use cases and so it wasn't a one-off but we deliberately chose um, a project that would kind of set the groundwork, uh, and part of the infrastructure was to set the groundwork for future work uh, in the bank. And then finally, uh, we originally used a bunch of off-the-shelf tools to build these models, but we found that they were kind of lacking in, in their use in kind of the large, large enterprises. So we built our own tools, uh, and that, kind of suite of tools basically forms the core of our business. So we've kind of packaged those suite of tools and called it Frontiers and, and, and sell it to big organizations so that their internal teams can build cool things with AI. So, and all of that was inspired by the first engagement at Scotiabank. Um, we also figured out a system in working with these large organizations. So I mentioned the kind of crazy three hour meetings with the whiteboard and the 10 cups of coffee with the executive at Scotia. Um, that kind of enthusiasm at like sea level execs is, is like still around. And it's, it's, it's awesome to get, get our foot in the door, but it's really hard to like get them focused on what, what, what to do. So every time we work with a client, we go through kind of a three-step process. So the first phase is we, what we call bl blueprinting. And so we sit with these executives, and the output is a list of use cases uh, and a, a good kind of uh, estimate of what their business impact is for each of these use cases. Sorry. Um, and it's really important that we get um, a bunch of people around the table. So we're getting people from the data team, we're getting people from the, the tech team, and we're getting like uh, lead, business leaders of, of particular verticals around the table at the same time, and, and we're, we're all discussing this, right? And we're sort of sorting the use cases by their technical feasibility, by the perceived or potential business impact, and by the availability of data. So many times, like an exec will be on an airplane and read this cool thing that Walmart did, and then ask us to do it, and it's just impossible because they don't have the right kind of data. So it's really it's a constraint that we want to like get in front of as soon as we can. And then we do this kind of um, somewhat obnoxious dragon's den, where we where we have uh, we get the top list of these use cases, and we get folks from these organizations to present them to senior management to pick which one to do. Um, so that's that's the first phase. So I'm actually like an engineer, and I, I've always found the first phase like useless. 
Um, <laughs> but this is, this is my personal bias because I do like to build things and write code, right? But it's absolutely essential because what it gives us hopefully is confidence in the use case and like a map of where we're going. But the second phase is when we start building things. So we build things with, uh, with internal teams. So we're on site and we're with the internal team and we're building on our platform. So we're building on our Frontiers platform with the internal team. And the goal is that we're kind of building capabilities with the internal team and we're building the infrastructure so that they can do future work in AI. And there's a lot of infrastructure that, that needs to be done. Um, again, you need GPUs, you need to make sure, you know, this is like, in the case of Scotiabank, it's very sensitive credit card data, so you, you, have, to, you have to be sure that it's totally secure um, and that it's, it's, you know, it's not going to leak. Um, and then the, the, the final stage of this is that we're, we're training thousands and thousands of models. So we're showing, you're, we're, we're not only building models and showing it millions of data points, but we're doing that for thousands of models. Uh, and the, the, the subtleties in this are choosing the, the best model is a function not only of like the kind of optimization problem, so it's not just a machine learning problem, but you're trying to like solve some business problem. So, so you're hoping that the, 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 the quantity that you're trying to minimize and optimize in the machine learning point of view is the same quantity that you're trying to minimize in like a business point of view. And it's actually a kind of a mix of art and science. The other point here is that you want like an audit trail of all of the training that you're doing. So again, that's an important piece of the, of the, of the platform that we built. And then finally, we, we've built this thing. Hopefully, it'll have business impact. We leave it with the team. Hopefully, we built kind of internal capabilities. And then we give them the tools so that they can build their own things. So the goal here is to like empower these teams so that they can run a bunch of interesting AI projects themselves. So um, our business is a software business, but there's this kind of upfront thing where we have to hold hands and help these teams uh, use our software, but the ultimate goal is to have them making cool things that we can talk about and they can talk about and that add kind of business value to their, to their, so this is, uh, some, this is what the, the software looks like. <laughs> um, now I'm going to talk about three different use cases for three different types of customers that we've done. Um, so we worked with this really big phone company and it's always weird that they call it a phone company because they also do like cable and internet and uh, uh, mobile phones uh, and they have, they have TV stations. Um, so, so they touch lots of different customers in lots of different ways and they have one call center. And when you call in this one number, you can like, you, you, I'm sure you know the frustration of being on the line for half an hour and, and not really getting anywhere. So they, they literally have this kind of choose your own adventure maps of like what to do with people in these call centers. And at the end of these, and these maps are like, they have like 3,000 branches on them. Um, so the, our goal with the project, with the telephone company is can we like optimize the route in, in the call center by predicting before someone calls why they would be calling, which sounds a little crazy, but if you think about it, um, the, 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 the internet part of the business will know if people live in a certain area and will know if there are outages in that area uh, and can predict with some confidence that if you live in that area, you might be calling about the, the internet issue. Or they know that you just got a bill yesterday and that it'd be a good assumption that if you're calling the day after you got the bill, it might be because there's some weird charge on it. So this is all about reducing the time on the phone, which is actually about improving customer, the, the customer experience. Okay, so this, is, um, this use case is a digital bank. So they ha it's like not a brick and mortar bank. It's, it's, uh, it's not very old. Uh, and and they're, they're trying to like increase their suite of, of offerings, but it's, it's all on the internet. So 
they're well aware that they don't have the kind of loyalty of like the big five banks. So it's not like my, you know, my mother was a customer of TD and her grandmother was a customer of TD and I got an account when I was five years old. So um, they want to do everything they can to like build this loyalty. And what they have is this crazy amount of information. So I think sometimes we think about like, we think about like how much information like Facebook has or like Google has, but um, if you think about a bank, every time you like swipe your credit card and buy a donut or a jacket, I mean they have, you, you swipe your credit card 20 times a day and they, they have this like year long history of you and they can build a, like a really interesting profile. So the idea with this digital bank was uh, can, we, can we improve the financial decisions that people make, knowing their history? So giving them like slight nudges, like we know you spend two bucks on a coffee every day, if you uh, reduce that to like every other day, you'd have an extra 500 bucks in your, in your pocket, things like that. Uh, and again, the goal there is to improve is to, is to, is, is like an added value to the customer to, to improve loyalty. Okay, the last use case is a, uh, a large mutual fund. And the large mutual fund at the front, the kind of front office of their business is using crazy analytics to like pick stocks and uh, efficiently trade, right? But they also have this back end of the business that's like super old fashioned. So, so, People are, are trading and they're, and they're, 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 they're increasing, like, they're, they're making clever decisions on trading, but when it time, gets time to, make, to, to collect the money and get the return, you have to like fax things in, you have to mail things in. Um, so they asked us to build with them the, basically the back office of the future. And it, it, the, the goal there, again, it's like a customer service play. It's like streamline the back office. Let's get people, they've, they've, they've put their money in this mutual fund for years. It's time to redeem and they deserve it and it shouldn't take a week. You shouldn't have to fax something in. So there's a lot of kind of cool opportunities there in like uh, optical character rec recognition and image recognition just to like get over the tedium of having to put things in the mail. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a prediction about the future, which is very dangerous, and I'm going to do it by talking about my great-grandmother. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when my great-grandmother immigrated to Canada, she was a seamstress, uh, and she worked at a sewing mill. Uh, and you, you, we actually know the building that she worked in. So she worked at 129 Spadina, and all of that area was like the, still called the Garment District, and it was a bunch of people working on machines, um, making garments, right? And so you can imagine a bunch of people with machines, kind of uh, uh, machines that would augment their labor, right? It would make them sew faster or sew more efficiently or more neatly or, or whatever it was. And um, so this is kind of like, you know, 100 years ago, an iteration of the Industrial Revolution, and people were... Um, this was kind of the high technology of the time. Uh, and, and, and the people who owned these businesses were, were kind of inventing these business models. Uh, and, you know, 99% of the population worked this way. So, in a weird kind of cosmic coincidence, this is, the, our office is on the sixth floor of the same building that my grandmother worked in. And I think it's really cool that we're kind of inventing machines that kind of think for people. Um, and I think, you know, all of these kind of businesses in the area are, are have cool startups that are, that are uh, working on these machines that will, you know, change the way people work by changing, like, their kind of intellectual output. Just in the same way a sewing machine changes your kind of manual output. And I think the changes to society and to the fabric of society will be as profound as they were in the Industrial Revolution. Um, so it'll be really exciting that, to see what happens in the next 10 years, and really exciting that we're kind of in Toronto and we have like a front row seat of all of these things that'll happen. Uh, that's it. Thank you.